The Legend of Prospector John Before I set out to hike the Grand Canyon, I was warned I may see some spooky things along the trail. People told me lots of folks had died down there on those steep canyon walls. My friend Matt told me the story of Prospector John. He said he was an old gold miner who went down into the Grand Canyon and was never seen from again. Legend says he turned into a cannibal and ate those he came across to survive. Matt told me people hiking near the Colorado River sometimes saw him, and if they did, they were done for. I laughed and dismissed my friend. Nice try, I said. I don't scare that easy. It was a picture-perfect June morning and I started out early on the South Kaibab Trail. It was like the fifth time I'd been to the Grand Canyon, one of the benefits to living in Phoenix, I guess. But I had never hiked down to the bottom before. It was always a quick stop, get out of the car, take a few photos, and take in the sights and leave. Get in and get out. Japanese tourist style. It's probably because I lived only a few hours away I didn't appreciate what was in my backyard. But I'd been getting into ultra running lately, and I knew some hardcore runners would run rim to rim, or even more. I wanted to see what the trail would be like. Maybe I could do it too. I figured I'd hike it first and see what the train was like before putting on my running shoes. The steep descent downward was spectacular. Brown rock became orange, became amber. Pockets of plant, sagebrush, needle grass, and snakeweed proved life could exist in the most unlikely of places. Touching the walls of the canyon felt magical and connected me to its ancientness. When I reached the bottom of the canyon, it was as if I was transported somewhere new. The Grand Canyon had always been breathtaking, but looking at it from the bottom, wow, I felt like I landed on a different planet and was the only person on Earth. The landscape at the bottom was dramatically different, of course. The Colorado River breathed life throughout the canyon floor. After about five hours of hiking, I reached an oasis called the Phantom Ranch. Curious name, I thought. It was a magnificent stone and wood place from the 1920s. The Phantom Ranch was the only lodging below the canyon rim. When I got there, it was closed for renovation. Not a soul was around. It was bad too because I was hoping for some help to navigate the river trail. My map didn't seem to quite match up with what I was seeing with my eyes. Over the sounds of the rushing river, a gentle breeze swaying the trees, I heard what sounded like pots clanging. There was a person here after all. I could get help. I walked along the bright angel creek towards the noise. Behind an oak, I saw someone hunched over along the banks of the creek. It was an old man, wearing a red flannel shirt and heavy wool pants, held up by suspenders. His face was as raggedy as his outback hat. As best I can tell, he was cleaning a pan in the creek. Hey, mister, I called over. Got a minute? I got a couple of questions about the river trail. Maybe you could help? The man kept kneeling and tending to his pan, but he turned his head my way. His face was as dirty as his hat. He had this unkept beard highlighted with a silver patch below his chin. He grinned at me flashing a mouthful of missing teeth. I help you, you help me, huh? He said, still smiling that toothless smile. Yeah, I guess, I told him. I was wondering about the river trail. My map seems all wrong. I was hoping to hike a bit, but I don't know. As I got closer to him, the wind picked up against my back, blowing me towards him. I grimaced. He smelled like he hadn't showered in years. Stinkier than those French people I ran into that time, the ones who didn't wear deodorant. I didn't think my nose could take it. His smell made me wretch. The river trail, he said as he put his pan down and stood up, pulling his suspenders outward in a cartoonish way. I can help you hike the river trail, but you help me first. I looked down and noticed the pan he had. He wasn't cleaning anything. That was a gold pan. He was prospecting. Suddenly, I remembered Matt's story. Prospector John. It had to be. The winds came alive and the trees danced as he spoke. 
Their limbs whipped and from them came chilling shrieks, the cries of the dead. Ghostly specters flew in the air, phantoms. It was a tree of life and death. I tried to run, but my legs wouldn't move. It was as if they were stuck in concrete. No, I said, this isn't real. I must have gotten heat stroke or bumped my head or something. This isn't real. I closed my eyes and opened them, thinking maybe I could wake myself up from this nightmare. But when I did, I saw vultures circling overhead. You help me, I help you, Prospector John said, now standing right next to me. His stink was overpowering. Body odor and musk and fetid rancidness. You give me that body of yours. I don't think you'll need it anymore, he said, licking his lips. He ran his fingers through his beard and gave me a crazy blank stare, as if he was looking deep into my soul. You give me that body of yours, then I'll tell you all about the trail, and you can hike it forever and ever. You can stay here at the Phantom Ranch, just like all the others you see. Spectres raced all around me. My eyelids felt sleepy and I closed them. The horizon stretched out before me, endless. A gust of wind blew from behind me and I opened my eyes. The sun was black. The canyon walls were magenta. The river was gold. Without any effort at all, I set out and hiked the river trail, floating over its gravel path. The Skywalk We were headed to the Grand Canyon to check out the Skywalk. You know, that horseshoe-shaped bridge at Eagle Point? It allows you to walk out over the canyon with nothing but glass underneath you at an elevation of 4,700 feet. The only issue was we were a bit lost. You see, the Skywalk is over at the West Rim. If you're not familiar with the Grand Canyon, well, it's big, massive. Most visitors go to the South Rim, which is the area that's closest to large population centers like Flagstaff. While we were gonna be spending most of our time in the South Rim, we wanted to see the Skywalk. It was too good of an attraction to pass up. So on a whim, my girlfriend and I decided to drive the extra five and a half hours to check it out. Yep, another 250 miles on the trip. We already logged more than a thousand miles, leaving from our place in Wichita, Kansas. But this was a bucket list vacation for us, so whatever. I gotta be honest, I was drained driving. My girlfriend, Julia, she was scared of driving, so I did the whole trip. We made it to the Grand Canyon in two days. I was gripping that steering wheel more than eight hours each day. So what's another five hours plus, I figured. Except, I should have known my limits. My old Toyota Corolla didn't have any fancy GPS, and out in this part of the country, I didn't have any phone coverage either, so we were left with a map. Julia reading a map is worse than Julia driving. We were going west on I-40. That was no problem. We turned at Kingman to head north, and that's when things started to go wrong. Julia said, pull over. Let's make sure we're going the right way. I said, no way I'm pulling over. I just want to get there. It wasn't quite a fight, but things were tense for a while. Julia refused to open the map, so I kept heading north, figuring we got to hit the Grand Canyon at some point. Well, Lady Luck was smiling down upon us because after an hour and a half of silence, the paved road ended. There was a bit of fog which seemed to come out of nowhere, but then it turned into a smaller dirt road and before us was the Grand Canyon in all its glory. We had arrived. We were in a very remote part of the canyon, it seemed. I wasn't sure we were in the right spot, but at least we arrived at the big hole in the ground and at least I can get out from behind that steering wheel too. I parked the car along the side of the road. Julia and I did a makeup kiss and we held our hands walking to the canyon's edge. By this point, the sun was starting to set, casting fabulous shadows of gold on the canyon walls. The rocks seemed to dance in the fading daylight. I took all of it in. This is why we took the trip. It was magnificent the most beautiful natural sight I have ever seen. As we were walking and I'm rubbernecking the canyon's majesty, Julia squeezed my hand. There it is, she said with excitement. The skywalk, come on. 
She pulled at me, wanting me to take off running with her. I let go of her hand, not seeing what she was seeing. Julia, what are you talking about? There's nothing there. She was already 10 yards ahead when I realized she was serious. She wasn't stopping. She was running right towards the ledge of the canyon. I'm looking all around and there was nothing, nothing. No skywalk, no people either. Just us in the canyon before us. Julia, come back. There's nothing there, Julia. She kept going, ignoring my screams. It's really beautiful, she yelled at me. You can walk right out over the canyon with nothing beneath you. She was at a full sprint. It will be just like floating over the canyon. Those were her last words. She seemingly vanished. One minute she was running towards the canyon. The next, poof, she was gone. She went down like a bag of bricks, like she was in one of those Roadrunner cartoons. I'm not sure what came over her or what she saw. All I know is that somewhere at the bottom of the canyon, so far down I couldn't see, is Julia's body. Sergeant Daniel Guffins jotted something in his notebook. Let's go over it again, he said. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Tell me again how your girlfriend ended up at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Bait. One of life's greatest pleasures is fly fishing. If you haven't been, you should. Out in the wilderness, wading in the cold river, you feel a real connection to the earth. You realize your place in it and you understand the meaning of go with the flow. What I'm saying is fly fishing calms the soul. It calms everything down. It forces us to live life as intended. Now, I've fly fished all over the world from the Yellowstone in Montana to the Battenkill in Vermont, even the rivers in the Jura Mountains in France. But this trip, this was a special one. The Colorado River in the base of the Grand Canyon. I had applied for this years ago. The waiting list was that long. I leave tomorrow flying out of my Denver home, and then I link up with a local guide who's taken me to the best spots on the river. I meet my guide, Gary, at the cafe at the Grand Canyon Park entrance. We engage in some general chit-chat, and he tells me how great the fishing is up and down the Colorado River. Never gets old, he says. He goes through his assortment of flies and tells me how the fish in the river aren't picky. They'll eat anything, he says. Then he looks around to make sure no one's listening and lowers his voice. I've also got a secret bait, Gary says, all hush-hush like he's telling me state secrets. I've heard this before from other guides. I don't know what it is. I'm assuming they want to impress clients, but they sure love talking about how they got some magic trick that really makes the fish jump. No, the best thing about guides is their knowledge of the river itself, not their choice of flies or lures. Our plan was to float down the river in a raft, casting for rainbow and brown trout allowing the current to take us through the heart of the canyon. Now, I had only seen the Grand Canyon from the top, which is already a sight to behold. I can only imagine what it looks like from the bottom. It's got to be like an ant looking at a human. Gary says at the end, we'll also fish for some striped bass as well. He says that's where a secret bait will come in handy. We head down at dawn the next day, and it's amazing from the start. Even if I wasn't fishing, I'd be okay. It was stunning at the bottom of the canyon. I mean, jaw-dropping. Willow, oak, and locust trees were plentiful along the river's edge. It was quite something to see how the river gave life to an entire ecosystem. And Gary was right. The fish were jumping. It didn't matter what I cast. It seemed like I was pulling out trout like no tomorrow. Big ones, too. Keepers, if I was keeping them which I never do because I only catch and release. We go on like this all morning, taking the occasional pit stop, sinking our feet into the sandy bottom of the river. We wade to some pools and snag even more fish. After wolfing down some sandwiches we pack for lunch, Gary asks if I want to see his special bait. I tell him, sure I do. 
I didn't really, I really didn't care, but since he was my guide, I wanted to be nice. It's meat, Gary tells me all excited as he walks over to his cooler, the one labeled bait. I shake my head like I didn't hear him right. Meat? You mean like minnows or worms or whatnot? I assume that's what was in his cooler. It usually is with fishermen. No, something bigger, Gary says. Really makes the fish come alive. They devour it. They all come to the surface. I tell you, you drop that line in with this meat on there and you're going to get the biggest bass you ever saw in your life. I'm talking hanging on the wall trophy fish. Well, he's got my interest now. I've heard all sorts of fish stories, but this one sounds like it's a whopper. Sounds like it's a tale he told many times before, too. It's probably all part of his Western Tour Guide Act. He opens his cooler and scratches his head. Shoot, I'm running a bit low, he says. He fumbles around and pulls out a medium-sized Tupperware container. Come on, come take a look. I get next to Gary as he flips off the lid and I nearly lose my lunch. The smell that comes out of that container is rancid. It's like the bottom of a trash can that's been sitting in the sun too long, mixed with some of that nasty French cheese I had to endure on my vacation. Inside that container are chunks of red meat cut into small cubes. I turn my head away and pinch my nose. It's disgusting. What the hell kind of bait is that, I say. I'm seriously about to lose it and I step away. I've seen it and I've smelled it and that's enough for me. How can you fish with that? It's rank, I say. Oh, you get used to the smell, Gary says with a smile as he closes the container and puts it back in his cooler. What is it, I ask. Well, that right there is Cindy. The fish love her. She was my last guest. The problem is, though, I'm running real low on bait. I crank an uneasy, tight smile, thinking Gary's joking. Then he pulls out a pistol and aims it at me. I instinctively freeze and put my hands up. My Adam's apple bounces as I give an audible gulp. You look like something the fish will really like, Gary says, his grin now wide, showing his teeth. With that little pot belly of yours, I think I'll have enough bait to last me quite a while. Certainly a few more fishing trips than I got out of dear old Cindy. The South Rim Herman I've been retired from the Park Service about eight years now. I think enough time's gone by where I won't get anyone into any trouble by disclosing some secrets. Plus, with the internet these days, this stuff might be common knowledge. Who knows? I worked at the Grand Canyon for nearly a decade. I saw a lot in that time. Most people asked me about the falls. Sure, we had all sorts of falls. Plenty of suicides. Selfie takers who weren't looking and slipped off the ledge. Daredevils who misjudged a step. Horny and drunk teenagers who got a bit too rowdy in the act before gravity took over. Like I said, you name it, I probably saw it. We kept most of this stuff out of the headlines, at least when we could anyways, so most people don't know what happens at national parks. There's also a code amongst park rangers, a bit like don't ask, don't tell. Remember that with Clinton and gays in the military? Yeah, well, that's how it was amongst us park rangers. Now, there's all sorts of stories about the Grand Canyon, ghosts and that sort of thing. They're all hogwash except for maybe a couple of them. Those are based on true events. Things like Lover's Ledge. That's the ledge where couples commit suicide together. That one's true. Maybe I'll tell you that story one day. But that other stuff? Well, I never saw it and I was there every day. There's one that's true though, and the public doesn't know about this one. The South Rim Hermit. Yeah, a hermit. He lived in the South Rim, the most visited place in the park. I saw him once when I was patrolling the campground. This was in 2012, May. We didn't get too many campers at that point because the weather was still quite cold at night, but there was still enough that the rangers had to make the rounds. Anyways, I was on duty alone that night when I saw something white sort of hobbling across the street. I thought it was an antelope or something. 
It startled me and I slammed on the brakes. When I got out my flashlight though, what I saw going into the forest, that was no antelope. It was the South Rim Hermit, the Hermit. There had been whispers amongst park rangers about a hermit living in the Grand Canyon, but we never had proof. Not until I saw him that night anyways. But because I didn't have backup, I let the hermit go. I didn't want to get into a confrontation. The South Rim Hermit looked like a crazy old man, shaggy long snow white hair and beard, tattered clothing that looked about two decades too old. He had an old man hunch too. It's no surprise most people thought the place was haunted. If you saw this guy at night, you'd think it was a ghost. Now, most hermits are harmless, but this guy, he was a real danger. You see, at that time we were having all sorts of weird things happening at the park. We always had petty crime, sure, but around that time there were accidental deaths. Ones who were supposedly pushed off the ledge by some stranger. There was no proof other than some cockamamie stories from traveling companions, but the police didn't believe that. There was also a lady murdered on the trail. She was cut with medical precision. We also had some deaths that occurred at the campground. Paramedics said they were heart attacks, but we knew that wasn't the case. The word was he lived in caves off forgotten about trails. They said he lived about 400, maybe 500 feet from the rim. Far enough down not to be seen, but high enough not to be seen either. You gotta realize most folks are looking across the canyon or towards the bottom of it. We looked with our binoculars, but we never spotted him. He was that good at hiding. After I saw him at the campground, we'd go looking for him all the time, but we could never get him. It was like we were always one step behind. He would switch caves and we would usually find evidence that he had been there. An old hat or clothing or candy wrapper. The thing is, some of those caves were nearly impossible to get into. We had no idea how he was able to get in and out. Us rangers could barely do it. Word was that the hermit was actually a doctor who ran into some trouble in Las Vegas and had to flee the mob. I don't know what he did, but I was told that he botched a surgery on a very important lady, if you know what I mean. Scarred her for life. So the mob was coming for retribution. He fled and eventually landed in the wilderness of the Grand Canyon, first camping, then taking up residence in a cave. No one in the park was safe from the hermit. He'd leave us park rangers alone, sure, but not the visitors. The visitors he would terrorize. Most of the time, they didn't even know it. At night, he would sneak into the campground, stealing food and supplies. Some people even reported feeling like they were being watched or that they felt somebody breathing on them. We told the campers it was a bear. Like I said, we searched and searched but never found the guy. I thought he had a contact on the inside and that's how he was able to elude us. When things got real bad, we put up signs for campers to stay alert. Again, we used the bear excuse. We couldn't tell the truth. The sign would have a big paw print and say, be aware, bear, food storage required. That was usually enough to get campers to pay attention. Stuff would still happen and things would still get stolen, but let's just say parents kept their children a little bit closer when those signs were up. And that was a good thing. When I was working the park entrance, I'd warn visitors, stay away from the crazies. That was as close as I got to mentioning something about the hermit. There was real pressure never to talk bad about the park or scare off visitors and especially the media. Never talk to the media. So the park rangers stuck to the script. We smiled and waved. That's probably the way they treated you at the park too. Nothing to see here, ma'am, with the tip of the cap. When I retired, the hermit was still out there, still haunting the park. Before I left, crime really started going up. I think the hermit was getting more desperate, but again, we couldn't prove anything. Right before I left, there was a two-year-old that vanished from the campground. We looked everywhere for the little boy, but we couldn't find him. Only the shoes in an empty cave. I don't even want to think about what happened. Millions of visitors go to the Grand Canyon every year. Most are safe and fine, but still, 
the danger is out there. The hermit is out there. Anyways, I hope I'm not getting anyone into trouble for telling you about the hermit. I like to think of this as more of a public service announcement, a word of warning. If you ever find yourself visiting the Grand Canyon and you see a shaggy old man with white hair and a white beard, stay away. Your life could be in danger. It could be the South Rim Hermit. Your dream trip could turn into a nightmare.